Okay, I think we can start. So uh, thank you very much for coming over. Hello, this everyone. Is, uh, it, is, it is our real honor to, to be here and, and talking with you about music uh, of The Witcher 3. Um, so who are we? We have very complicated names. Yeah, so my name is uh, Marcin Przybyłowicz, and I'll try not to pronounce my name because that may be really difficult for you. So let's just agree that I'm Marcin, not Marcin. Marcin, like marching, so that's easy to remember. Uh, I'm music director and composer at CD Projekt Red. I'm working uh, on the Witcher series for over five years now. Um, before that, I scored a number of mobile and uh, indie games. And this is Mikolaj. Yes, I'm Mikolaj Strowinski. I go by Mick, if it's easier. And if you have a problem, if you have a problem pronouncing my, my family name, it basically sounds like strong whiskey. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a freelance, uh, as, as you see. I have to read this. I'm a freelance video game composer. Uh, and uh, before The Witcher 3, I worked on uh, the game, maybe you heard, uh, The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. And I wrote a lot of TV before that. And the uh, project that was uh, pivotal for me to, to move to video games was a trailer for Dark Souls 2. So uh, we want to show you our creative uh, process behind composing and producing The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt soundtrack. We want to analyze and show why it gained so much attention among critics and players and treat that as kind of postmortem to our work. Mm. And to tell you more about The Witcher, uh, we, would like to, um, we would like to tell you more about where it came from, the, about the French franchise lineage, um, and how it all affected our work. It all started with, uh, yeah, with The Witcher, uh, book hero in, the first story was written in 1988 by a very pro prolific Polish, uh, p Polish uh, fantasy writer, Andrzej Sapkowski. Uh, in 1988, he wrote a story, which was then followed by um, two volumes of, of two short volumes of, of stories, and then um, and then a couple more books. Uh, just to remind you, witchers are professional monster slayers. Witchers are mutants with su superhuman superhuman abilities, and the most important one, most famous one, is Geralt. Now, after, uh, after the books, um, people in Poland decided to uh, film, to make a movie about The Witcher, and I hope you will never see it, because it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a terrible one. Uh, disastrous, I've heard. I chose not to see it, and you should do the same, in order not to spoil the view uh, you have on, on Geralt. Uh, but I heard uh, Marcin saw it. Uh, yeah, I have this... Um privilege, I would say, to see in this movie, actually. Uh, we bought the tickets for a uh, cinematic premiere uh, one time, and uh, the saddest part of that story is that right before screening of the movie, they showed us trailer to Lords of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, and so basically we did watch Kick-Ass, three minutes long trailer of awesome stuff, and then we were presented with almost two hours long movie with Robert Dragons, so you can imagine yeah. how sad we were after that. It, it, Actually, the subtitle of this, of this movie was The Witcher and Robert Dragon. So after that, uh, TV series, really. I didn't know about TV series because I was already in, in America. But uh, if it was one, then it just shows that Polish people don't give up. Uh, they, they fight even, even, even if they know they'll die. Um, but luckily, they fought. And The Witcher, the first video game, uh, came to the surface in 2007. Then there was 2011, which I believe Martin had already his musical contribution in. Yes, exactly. A little bit. And finally, happy year of 2015, uh, where The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt came about, which we are here to talk about. Um, now, as you see, The Witcher has already been present in film, TV, uh, books, comics, and video games. And um, the fan base of, of, of Witcher had already certain expectations, certain expectations about what the, what the soundtrack should sound like. And we had to meet them. We had to choose whether we're going to go the easy route uh, with you know, generic music, which could have been done. But we chose not to. We chose to go challenging route to take risks. And it paid off. Uh, the, uh, 
and our case was similar to to this of Batman, Superman, or or, or other uh, you know heroes that that already existed in other media, and uh, we needed to decide what we're going to do with the music because of that. So what did we do? We decided to redefine musical style for The Witcher Three. Uh, the following points that you see in the picture all affected our soundtrack. Uh, the Witcher universe is heavily grounded in Slavic folklore. Yes, a lot of uh, characters, a lot of stories and sub-stories uh, present, uh, present in the game are d directly taken from, uh, from legends, from that, from that region. It's a, it's a fantasy game, so that's, that, which is naturally, which is a genre uh, directly connected to um, to specific kind of music as well. Uh, game's main, main feature, the long engaging story with, uh, with its sub-stories as well, that also had to be reflected in our soundtrack. Nothing is good or bad uh, in, in the game as well, even if something evil happens, uh, even if there's an evil character, there always seems to be some sort of justification of, of his or, or, or her actions and uh, therefore everything is kept in a gray zone. Again, another element that had to be kept in mind while doing the music. There is a lot of choices and a lot of consequences that, that, that players are exposed to. And there is the element of non-linearity. Non Sorry, difficult word for me. Uh, which, uh, which is connected with the fact that it's an open world. You know, player can go whatever, players can go whatever they want. Uh, and... Um, but everything had to be done under the linear music, the, the um, umbrella, under the umbrella of film-like music, which, which helped tell the story. We're going to continue on that later on. And now uh, Martin will tell you more about the pre-production process. Yeah, so once we know what we are up with, we are ready to actually start working on the game itself. So first stage of production is obviously pre-production. We had to figure out how to deal with issues and challenges that were ahead of us. Uh, the most important thing was to do as much preparations as possible to basically save time, and so production phase would be as easy as possible. Obviously, not every time happens that a lot of planning translates to complete success and something didn't work out quite good along the way. Uh, we're going to address that issues also. Uh, but uh, basically, all those sets of, uh, of those words you can see here on the slide uh, basically can give you some impression of what we aimed for with planning our soundtrack. So first of all, we decided to mix Slavic folk with big contemporary sound. Normally in um, fantasy games, people expect big, broad orchestral sounds with choirs, percussion, strings, and so on. Uh, because of the Witcher franchise is so heavily grounded in Slavic folklore, Slavic mythology, that was kind of obvious for us. We would have to also reflect that somehow in music. So uh, Slavic folk. Uh, then uh, that was uh, when we started working on Witcher 3 that was a really important moment for us uh, regarding technical stuff uh, because we were just uh, finished with the Witcher 2 we uh, decided to leave F-Mode game audio middleware to Wise so that opened up uh, quite new possibilities for us regarding how we would deal with game audio systems and stuff like that and that also uh, goes to another thing that Mikowai uh, already uh, uh, talked about briefly. So our main focus on, on soundtrack was to make music feel like it was composed for every single player separately. So we wanted to achieve that effect that when someone plays the game, it, he or she can feel that music was you know, tailored just for him. So... Uh, one thing to one way to, to to achieve that was to make sure that music would feel like basically a film, like a long story. So linear in non-linear environment. We need to remember that we are not also on, only dealing with a video game, but uh, th that particular one was a very complex one. That was open world RPG uh, with non-linear story, which was branching on multiple levels. So music system had to also address those issues and uh, handle the music itself in a way that basically that could be done. Uh, another thing is obviously budgets and costs of live recordings. Uh, we knew we had a very big game ahead of us to score, and doing this with the live orchestra would 
cost tons of money. And we knew we would, wouldn't probably get as much budget as we wanted to, so we had to think how to be clever about that and how to basically do what we aimed for, but uh, you know, make it cost less, right? Uh, so if the game was big, amount of music was big, another question pops in, how to not kill ourselves with that big amount of music? So again, we would have to come up with some clever uh, approach uh, to composition process, then implementation, production phase, and so on. Uh, one of the uh, ways we decided to, to do that was to uh, have a, great, a greater use of leitmotifs compared to our previous games. And the next slide briefly shows you how much of those thematic work we actually did throughout the whole game. Obviously, we have uh, our main theme along uh, with uh, two other uh, themes that are from previous games. These are our legacy themes. And apart from that, we can see we have a bunch of uh, specially composed, custom-made themes just for The Witcher 3. Uh, those themes obviously served as a bridge and help uh, the vast amounts of music uh, sound cohesive because that was uh, one of the challenges. Uh, exactly challenges and, and one of the most important things uh, we wanted to maintain. So, okay, we know uh, what we're going to do. Now we have to answer the question, how are we going to do it? Uh, since we are about to do uh, some Slavic folk music, we need to think, okay, uh, how are we going to approach that? We had a really big database of uh, folk music from Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, Germany, Slovakia, Russia, you name it. Uh, at, at some point, we just... It, it struck us, actually, that maybe we shouldn't just treat it as a point of reference. Maybe we should you know, reach out for some bands, some performers maybe, and get in touch with them, invite them to cooperation, not to work for us, but work with us, and uh, try uh, to f work on something completely new and, and original. Uh, our choice was uh, the band Percival, and I'm sure most of you are already familiar with them. Uh, of course, other great musicians as well. We're going to introduce them later on. And... Um, about the things that didn't work out very well. Uh, I need to admit that uh, the beginning of our work was quite difficult because it turned out that um, we didn't get along, actually, uh, at the very beginning. Why is that? Uh, I'm a uh, trained musician, trained composer, just like Mikowai, and it so happened that we were about to deal with people who are self-taught. What does it mean? That means they do not know how to read musical notation. That means they taught themselves how to play instruments. So their playing techniques would be much different than, for example, playing techniques I was learning when I was at Musical Academy. Uh, that meant also that they quite didn't understand what I was talking to them because I was using musical terminology. So uh, to be honest, the first day of the recording session, we were basically wasting money, burning money, because you know time flies, uh, time is money, and we didn't get any stuff recorded. We just struggled, we tried, we discussed, and um, one, th one thing I discovered, they weren't even able to record the click track, which is pretty standard procedure when you go to a recording studio and you are about to do music, right? So at some point, we realized we have to figure out a way to basically communicate with each other, to find some common ground, some common line of communication, and follow that line. So um, at some point, I decided to just ditch this whole uh, you know, stuff I prepared, and I was prepared very, very well. I presented them sheet music, mock-ups, spreadsheets with themes written down, broken down to tempos, time signatures, key signatures. I was really, really well prepared, and Believe me, I wasted so much time on that to, to basically not suck during the process. Uh, that all went um, to trash, and we had to figure out what to do. So we thought, okay, so maybe if we cannot communicate with each other on you know, language level, maybe we can communicate on musical level. So instead of just doing recording sessions, maybe we should organize a jam session. Let's improvise a bit. So pick that instrument, pick that instrument, just play me four chords, just play me some riff on top of that. Uh, maybe we could try improvising some vocals on it. And suddenly, magic happened. Uh, 
they started to play, and they started to play with the way I wanted them to play. Uh, they started to be happy about it. I started to be happy about it because, you know, we were progressing. And um, I could say the rest is history because uh, we end up having kickers material after, what, seven or eight days of recordings. And that was 12 hours a day, so, you know, pretty long time. Uh, and then we were able to actually take away this material, go to our studio, edit it, and work on it. Uh, so once you know that story, maybe we can now talk you through uh, the process of selection of instruments we, we pick. Uh, since the core of our soundtrack would be on solo performances, we picked our instruments very carefully. We looked uh, for unique sound, obviously, but also what we cared about was the history behind each instrument because we believe that if you pour a lot of soul into the music, people will hear it and basically love it. So the first one... So this is baglama, or called saz, if you like. If you like, this is basically the same, the same instruments. This is our primary plucked instruments for the whole uh, musical palette of the Witcher 3 soundtrack. And the fun fact is that's not even Slavic instruments. Uh, the country of origin is Turkey. So, um, and you're going to see that we have a lot more examples of that later on. Uh, second one, also, as I could say, um, a signature instrument to the Witcher sound. That's one not also not Slavic. Uh, that comes from Eastern Mediterranean, so Greece and Turkey. And interesting story behind it is that Percival actually built that instrument themselves. Uh, the design was based on original medieval iconography, so they looked for proper wood, proper strings, proper materials, and proper craftsmen, basically, to, 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 to make that instrument. Uh, the next one is really interesting. Uh, this is Herdy Gurdy, and this is, um, to spice up things a little bit, this is the most Slavic instruments you can get. That instrument comes from uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, its origins are in Poland, Hungary, Belarus, and Ukraine. Yes. That particular one is very, very special because it was custom-built for Robert uh, Jaworski, a uh, folk virtuoso from Poland. Uh, regular Herdy Gurdy has uh, three strings. That one has seven. Uh, thanks to that, uh, the instrument has much bro broader uh, scale compared to regular ones, and also the sound of the Kerdigerdi. That one particular is much more darker, grittier, and probably you could say more devilish. If, if, if I may say something, it's wor worth noting that the name Kerdigerdi was uh, invented by a Swedish cook from a Muppet Show. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Uh, yeah, Renaissance fiddle. So as you can hear... Uh, you can hear it very well for a reason. Yeah, the, re the quality of this recording is very crappy. When I took that clip, I didn't know I would be presenting my stuff on GDC, so you have to uh, um, forgive me that. Uh, but basically, this is another custom-built instrument just for Robert. It's based on original Renaissance design, and the special thing about it is that it has a pickup, like a guitar or a bass guitar, so you can basically plug a cable into it, amplify it with the speakers, apply uh, some guitar effects, and, and achieve really, really uh, crazy uh, sound. And how does it sound? Well, I have a short clip for you. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, next one is also very special. So basically, a piece of wood with few strings attached to it with a big <laughs> hole in it, and you have another instrument. Uh, it's a Bowet Gusli, and the Polish name is Gęślegdańskie, another very difficult word for you, so don't bother with that. Uh, I'm just mentioning that because uh, basically this is a replica uh, built especially for Robert, uh, based on archaeological remains found in Gdańsk, Poland, hence the name Gęślegdańskie, in 1940s. Original designs, experts say, was from 12th century, so probably that's the only instrument from, from, from 12th century built uh, with the original designs, so that's also a very special thing for us that we were able to you know, incorporate that, that instrument into our palette. Uh, and other ones? Yeah, yeah. So while, while Marcin uh, recorded uh, Percival in Warsaw, I took care of some recordings in Los Angeles and recorded some uh, wonderful musicians. Uh, one of them was Amir Yagmai. Uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist from Iran, or from Iran, I should say. And he plays guitar, he plays violin, he plays uh, oud, he plays... Uh, he plays uh, this wonderful instrument, which is called Yali Tambur. Uh, it, uh, it originates from Turkey, and uh, and is basic. What it means is basically it's, it's Turkish guitar. By adding yali in front of it, it makes it Turkish bass guitar. It can be bowed. It can be plucked. It has a bright uh, bright, bright sound. And the semitones uh, are on the frets, and the frets are movable. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds really cool. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, now this particular one doesn't have any any amazing story behind it. However, the next one, being a combination of a violin and a zombie, <laughs> it, it looks great. It sounds more or less the way it looks. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it originates from India. It made its way to Nepal and Iran. Uh, and uh, this particular one was found by Amir's grandfather 50 years ago in some forgotten village uh, in the south of Iran. And uh, it served as a decoration on, on a tavern, tavern wall. Back then it was 100 years old, so you know, now it's even older than that. Uh, fun fact about it, that it's carved out of one piece of wood. And as you see, it has two hollow chambers. Uh, I'm going to show you the example of how both of them sound. There is a call and response coming. The call comes from Yali Tambor being bowed. I think it's a great sound. And the response is coming from Gajcek. Yeah, I, it's Gajcek, Gajcek. I'm, I'm not sure. There's probably a wrong way to pronounce it. But uh, yeah, here it comes. Once again. One more time? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. OK. <laughs> So those are the, the two instruments. Uh, one more instrument that I want to tell you about is viola. That's uh, not any viola, because this one was made in 1610. So actually very close to when, when Geralt was alive. Uh, it's Magini, which is the viola equivalent of Stradivari, Stradivarius. And it was discovered in a closet in Germany uh, in the bombed down Dresden city. And it was in pieces torn to pieces. I'm not sure how the player Andrew Duckles got hold of it, but he did. And he restored it in Los Angeles. Took a year, it took a whole year to restore it. A lot of money as well. A uh, guy named Michael Fisher uh, restored it. He had to find uh, exact kind of wood that, that was originally in the instrument. So it turned out to be you know, like a Frankenstein viola. Uh, it's very large. Back in, 17, uh, back in 17th century, people didn't play viola like this. They played on lap, like a, like a cello, vertically. Uh, it was much bigger. Now, Andrew Duckles is a big guy, uh, and he can play it like this. He's a virtuoso. So, but, and it sounds amazing. I don't have an example here, but it's in the soundtrack. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's Andrew's viola. There are more instruments. Uh, one more time. Okay, more instruments, as you see, uh, that we don't, will not have time to talk about. Uh, they were all live, recorded. 
Well, thank you for that. And so this you ruined is this, that. Yeah, this is to so. Uh, okay, so to talk to you briefly. Uh, Bazooki, Lira, vocals, electric violin, cello, electric cello, electric cello, acoustic, acoustic cello, cello, and vocals. Lots of them. Yes, a lot of them. So yeah, uh, the stuff we recorded has influenced our approach to uh, music composition and our implementation choices. So one thing you need to be aware of if you are dealing with medieval or period instruments is that their natural tunings can uh, basically set the tone for your work. Uh, most of our instruments were in D natural, so that was um, some clue for us uh, what to do with them. Uh, as you know already, my story with Percival and recording sessions, uh, you already know that a great amount of uh, improvised performances happened along the way. Uh, we did it a lot, and uh, because of that also partially, we, as you already also know, decided to focus uh, um, our soundtrack on more, on more of those uh, follow, uh, solo performances instead of uh, standard, uh, standard palette. So, if you take the those choices, you also have to deal with consequences. consequences. Yeah, and the consequences are, yes, five hours of D minor. <laughs> after, that, after that, it was really challenging to me to, to compose another, any other key. Even C, major, <laughs> even C major was a challenge. But, you know, D minor is nice. It has a nice topography. It has a nice sound. Uh, so... Um, yeah, so that's, what, that's one consequence of, of, of those recorded instruments. Another one is improvised staff transport into great tavern queues. Now it's probably worth me mentioning that when Martin was doing jam sessions with, with Percival, I'm sure there was a lot of alcohol and cigarettes involved. But there are no photos for, for, to prove that, though? But it's, it's for a good reason, you know. It's for tavern queues, so, you know. I have my own click truck. <laughs> so, uh, it worked. <laughs> He had to. He had to edit it. Also, you know. Uh, it's, all, all, it's all to serve the art, right? Yes. After yes. All. Yes. Worth the pain. Uh, and uh, yeah, those solo, as you see, those solo parts became the core of the soundtrack, and the songs. Songs. We'll yeah. Uh, more it turned out them. that songs happened to be important part of our soundtrack. Uh, we had three brilliant vocalists uh, from Percival. Uh, and we used uh, their talents a lot. And I think the most uh, bright and shiny example of uh, how much love and care we, 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 we took about uh, songs is a uh, Priscilla song case. If you played The Witcher, you already know that uh, at some point of the game, Geralt is attending a uh, pretty awkward concert for him because Priscilla is singing song about his love to Yennefer. Um, interesting musical story behind it is that this song has been translated to all seven languages we did, so Polish, English, German, Russian, French, Japanese, and Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, that was uh, kind of a technical uh, challenge for us to not only compose the beautiful song, beautiful ballad, but also to make it work in all those seven languages, to translate that song to you know fit the number of syllables within the phrase, to sync it perfectly with the lute track, that uh, took us some time to, 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 to figure it out how to do it, and I think that's the good example to actually prove that uh, basically we care about songs very much. Yes, you press it. Uh, My turn. Yep. So, musical direction, don't focus on the game. Do you? Yes, good, okay, it works. <laughs> A set of mechanics under player's disposal. What this complicated sense means, sentence means is that some other games have implementation done down to almost every step of the player. This approach, however, might not serve best in terms of telling the story and the overall narration of the game. So, uh, well, yeah, so if you take the music away from any medium that it, that it accompanies, uh, it, it, it has its own emotions, it has its own, it has its own pacing. And, and we really loved how the, the natural pacing of music dances and intertwines with, natural, with, with the pacing of the game, how it kind of dictates it, uh, rather than the other way around. And so, yes, we could have done the implementation in more detailed way, in more detailed way, there are games that have the impl audio implementation done uh, more more technically. However, uh, we chose not to do that. We chose to let the music sing, and that was a risk. And I think it paid off well. 
Uh, like I said, the, uh, the story and its pacing it comes from the music as well. Um, it, this approach also makes the music matter. Uh, it gives its own voice and story to tell, and it let the uh, emotions shine as well from the music, not being interrupted by you know little little uh, sync points that, that go to uh, uh, the sound engine. Um, and scoring with songs, yes, songs is, is just a, you know everything on it's on top of everything. I'll just make just this approach just makes the music even more important. Yeah, as you probably know, uh, we use uh, a lot of songs uh, throughout the whole game, and uh, obviously um, one might ask the question, okay, but what about the um, correlation between songs and spoken dialogue, for example? So uh, we don't obviously want to draw the uh, player's attention out of the dialogue because of, you know, some chick is saying some words with song, right? So... Uh, we decided we would uh, basically use songs in gameplay situations. Uh, what gameplay situations? It turned out once we started to test our game uh, at our headquarters uh, with, with the music that slaying monsters and casting spells feels much more awesome when you have kicking rock riffs and wailing vocals basically you know, supporting you. you you can actually feel like kick-ass monster slayer. So uh, that was uh, uh, really a no-brainer for us uh, to decide that, okay, so our combat encounters uh, would be scored with songs. And uh, no matter if the song would be sung in Polish, Ukrainian, Hungarian, because we have all of those, really. But that doesn't matter. It's all about emotions and the way the song makes you feel about yourself and feel you as Geralt. Uh, a monster slayer. So that's why uh, I think our songs shine in the soundtracks, shine in the game, and are one of the ways we are actually pushing the music towards the front of a player. Um, to, to summarize that part of uh, the presentation, we have a short video clip for you, which I hope presents all of those thoughts we presented for you. So take a look and hear. We knew someone special was to arrive. We read beast entrails, saw the omens. We would glimpse her likeness, a mirage in a cradle. She came from the lower swamp. We knew not at first it was her the omens had spoken of. A child of the elder blood. The sown seed that will burst into flame. She fell to our hands. Elder blood. Mm, the blood of the traitress. Not the kind of bra you would see on Fox TV. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to tell you uh, a few words about implementation. So how did we make it all work? Um, you already know we uh, decided to pick WISE, Game Audio Middleware, uh, to handle all the audio music stuff. And within WISE, we decided to build our own adaptive music system. The goal was simple. We wanted to have responsible, fast, adaptive music system that would, would work in nonlinear uh, quest structures. Obviously, we use layers, parameters, and states, but I, I, I guess that's obvious for all of you here. Uh, the important thing regarding our system is that it's based on two pillars. Uh, first one is location-based exploration and combat music. So whenever Geralt is visiting some place, the... Novigrad, some forests, swamps, whatever, uh, that particular location has its own set of, uh, is that, okay, yeah, I, I thought I vanished for a second, uh, uh, set of uh, exploration music and 
paired combat pieces with that. Second pillar, also more, also important, is all the Taylor music we did for quests. So uh, that means all the cutscenes music, dialogue, quest-specific uh, segments, or uh, some custom gameplay situations, like, for example, when we have to chase someone or stuff like that. Uh, one of the aim uh, that Mikowai already briefly talked about when we designed our music system was not to sacrifice music artistic value and essence to perfect implementation solutions. Uh, we decided to at first be, um, at first try to, uh, f um, how do I say that, um, think about um, narration of music and what kind of story music has to tell itself uh, rather than uh, just, you know, thinking about it as a set of assets and just divide it mathematically. Um, this is one of the examples of uh, one of the locations in Prologue, White Orchard, and each of those uh, green blocks represents one queue. Uh, these are standard exploration and combat queues here, as well as uh, that tailored music I mentioned for quest events and cutscenes. And this is how they work together. So even though we uh, did try to maintain this artistic beauty of music and have the music its own voice, we tried to do as sophisticated system as possible. And that, real, that little spider web is, is showing you uh, uh, how basically uh, that translates to the technical side. Don't be confused uh, about the visuals. This is F mod, and I just use that to, to sketching because I like sketching in F mod, but we are still on Ys, okay? Uh, so to summarize briefly what we just told you. Yes. Uh, so how, are, how, how did our music turn out uh, exactly? Well, players seem to like it a lot, but why? Uh, one of the reasons, we believe, is uh, pitch tuning imperfections. Um, as you heard in, in, in examples that we showed you, uh, a lot of music was, very, was quite out of tune. For this, particular, uh, for this particular project, it worked out very well. But in general, imperfections are what, what make uh, music beautiful. Uh, you, we could, you know, you, you, can, you, you, can, you can try to make the sound perfect down to the beat, and, uh, but we believe it, it, would, it would happen at, at, the, at, the co at, at certain cost. Um, very important uh, sentence today is the second one. Don't be afraid to experiment. Go wild with ideas. And this is, uh, this is what we want you to, to take away from this, from this, from this, uh, from this lecture today. Uh, we, chose to, we chose to go wild. We chose to risk, and the risk paid back. And um, vocals, as Marching said, are very important. Uh, push the music towards the foreground. And uh, our formula uh, is to, it, it's, a, it's a generally good, good, good formula, to take something that people are accustomed to and on top of that introduce something that they don't expect. That's, that's, good, in, 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 that's good on every level, uh, we think. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, a couple of uh, closing thoughts uh, for you. Uh, we have read numerous amounts of reviews. Uh, for our game, and uh, almost everyone highlighted music as a strong part of the game. That means a lot to us. Uh, we, we read a lot of those, so uh, that, I think, also represents uh, that correlation between pouring your soul into a project and um, you know, having the, the love back from the players, as we described uh, before. Uh, the Witcher 3 soundtrack has spawned lots of fan covers, including YouTube celebrities uh, like Maluka or Taylor Davis. Uh, I think that's another example of uh, how our music turned out to be and uh, how likable it turned out to be. Uh, we would like to encourage you, if there are composers out there uh, 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 in the room, to do not be afraid of experiment and sometimes take controversial decisions because at, in the end, uh, if you are really dedicated uh, to your work and you love what you are doing, that can really pay it off and basically you can receive lots of love from people. Uh, I know that the, the, the second to last sentence about staying true yourself and loving your world is the most cliche thing you will probably hear today, but uh, it kind of um, summarizes our journey through, 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 through the Witcher uh, soundtrack and, and um, basically tells everything you need to know about uh, our work and 
Last yes. but not least, don't be afraid of vocals because I personally believe that today, nowadays, in video games music, we could use local vocals a lot more. Let me just add to this cliche uh, sentence that Martin had. When, when you work on a project for a long time, you know, after, after a couple of weeks, it's easy to, to stop, to really stop loving it. But, so, but the longer you maintain this loving attitude to your art, to your you know, musical child, the, 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 better, the better it will turn out for everybody. That's it, people. That's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? questions? Microphone. Microphone. Okay. <laughs> or shout very loudly. Hi there. My name is Isabella Ness. I'm a composer oh. and a sound designer. And um, I have one quick question about your theming. Um, specifically with Song of the Sword Dancer and the Vagabond, the melodic theme is the same in those, but the rhythm is very different. And did you pay very careful attention to how you made it out the rhythmic displacement, and did you have any ideas about how you wanted that to affect the player experience? Vagabond and second... Song of the Sword Dancer. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, wow. Oh. Okay. I haven't expected that. Uh. Yes, is the answer. <laughs> yes, we had to experiment with rhythm a, a, a lot because well, we were in the same key. That's one reason. You picked a uh, very very different pieces because uh, the Vagabond is a expiration piece, an expiration piece, and the song of the sword, sword Duster is shining an example of wailing vocals during combat, right? So, um, God damn it, I don't even know how to respond to your question, really. Uh, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, they have the same melody. The theme is exactly the same between them. Yes, that's because we tried to... Um, Recycle the material. Oh, that doesn't sound good. It okay. was very effective. <laughs> uh, there was this slide about thematic work, so that was important for us to basically use themes as some sort of glue uh, with the so whole soundtrack because of the distribution of uh, regions and, other, and, and musical influences we had uh, among those. Uh, so that was pretty obvious for us. We had to, uh, or we wanted to, 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 to use some pre-existing themes or themes we, we composed throughout the whole game. But regarding arrangement and rhythms, um, I don't think there is that much of a theory or ideology behind it. Uh, I think it just happened by itself uh, during the process of composition. And yeah, basically that's it. Thank you. Hi, you talked about how you tried to look into the history of each instrument in order to work with it and create this sort of Slavic experience, but then you described how all these instruments come from Italy and Greece and Turkey and Iran. Were yes. you surprised by how multicultural your instrumentation that you used as kind of the core of this was? Uh, but also the Slavic part came from the performances as well. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's also not on the, the instrument is obviously the important part of the process. But if you just strip it out of the you know the awesomeness, it's just a tool, right? Yeah. Just the just the object you are using to create music. So uh, it's all about the way you use that instrument. So when you, for example, you listen to traditional Turkish performances of Kemenches, so that little fiddle thing, right? Uh, the kasha plate, the red hair girl. Uh, it sounds very different uh, compared to what we uh, did with, with Kemencha in our soundtrack. So it's how you use it, what kind of sound you produce out of that instrument, what kind of scales you use, for example. Uh, so that, I think, also... Um, mm, uh, uh, influences. Uh, influences the way the music sounds in the end. OK, thank you. Hi, guys. Really, really enjoyed the talk, uh, especially the ethnomusicological overview of all the instruments. Uh, it's really cool to just see the variety of timbres and styles and that are all associated with that. Um, my question regards, uh, when you're working with musicians, 
like as you were saying, that come from very different backgrounds. They come from a sort of a self-taught or a by-ear route. And you're trying to work with them. You're working to develop certain types of motivic material that you can then use. You're coordinating with musicians in Poland, musicians in Los Angeles, um, all of which are kind of working in, in different spheres, I guess. Like how do you, how do you bring that all together uh, for the final product? Or did you find it, did, or what kinds of difficulties did you find as you were doing that? Did we find difficulties? Well, you did at the beginning. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was you know partially the improvisation uh, that was done on both on both continents, and uh, and partially it was you know playing the the themes that were precomposed already. Uh, I don't know, Martin. By the way, how you how you made these guys from Percival to play the themes if they didn't? Did you sing? La 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 la. Yeah, I was like, actually um, <laughs> trained in singing. So, yeah, just don't ask me to sing Okay, anymore. no, I'm not. Uh, and then we swapped files, and uh, that's what made it cohesive. Yeah, the bottom line was that with those, all those recording sessions uh, in L.A., in Poland, the, the plan was to build our own musical library we would use to, to uh, build our soundtrack around it. So we ended up with hours of recordings. We edited up, we edited up, we chopped to, you know, uh, leaks, musical sequences, riffs, loops, drum patterns, because we also did record drums, but we forgot about it when, he, when we did presentation. Um, so think about it as you knew sample library you, you buy, for example. So that's, that was our base set of uh, sounds uh, we wanted to use in that project. And whenever we felt that, for example, oh, that, that Baglama part or that Yali Tambur, that Yali Tambur lake or, or Reef would, would feel useful in that piece, we just used that. So it was all about having additional uh, firearms under our sleeves, basically. Cool, thanks. Hey guys, great talk and also amazing music in the game. Thank you very much for Thank you. Thank you. giving me hours of enjoyment. <laughs> um, I have two quick questions. And the first one is, what kind of direction did you give the musicians to get um, the best results in terms of, did you say this is a battle scene, just be angry with your instruments? What kinds of direction, or you know, this is a romantic scene or this is a romantic piece. What kind of direction did you give your musicians? Uh, well, um I believe that, uh, and I also work with uh, my supervisors in the same way, that if you are well briefed, uh, you're going to deliver uh, the best possible work. So my responsibility as music director was to brief them as much as possible and to provide them all the necessary information they had. So when we did recording session, we had already working game. So we were able to present them some gameplay videos, some concept art, renders, uh, game art, uh, and also tons of scripts, uh, spoken dialogue lines, and, and just you know my imagination working with, for example, saying them, okay, now we're gonna play tavern piece, so imagine that we're in this wooden medieval tavern, there are lots of dwarfs, so you know, uh, kicking the, each other asses, for example. <laughs> there's some bum in the corner, drunk and sleeping. Uh, there's some uh, um, um, some um, courtesan or prostitute, yeah. for example, you know, looking for customers. So imagine that thing, and yeah. we need to come up with some musical mood for that. So also, you can put the players into into certain modes by by telling them how how to feel. Like you got to make this more angry, feel more anger. Right, you know, right. you cannot really. Uh, put this on, on, on paper, you, you know, you, you describe a certain situation like, I'm sorry to say it, but maybe, you know, imagine like someone died in your family, you know, this wow. kind of, so yeah. it's, it's horrible, but it's, it, this evokes extreme emotions, you know, which, which you want to catch. While One more recording. thing that, that also worked uh, in my case, that um, surroundings, so if you are in the studio environment, you have very limited options of adjusting your space, but even small things like, for example, toning down the light can do wonders with, cool. uh, you know, adjusting them, toning them into the right emotional mood you want to achieve. So uh, that can also work. Wonderful. And great job on that and getting the emotion out. The second question is, in the, the wise implementation of your adaptive music system, how long did that take and how many people did you have working on it? Uh, it took us... Um, 
I guess, half a year to finally figure out what do we want and don't, what do we need for The Witcher 3. And regarding manpower, uh, we did uh, prototype the system uh, with two guys, so audio programmer and senior quest designer, my friend, but all the implementation was done by me, so just one man army. Wow, well, good job, thank you very much. Thanks. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I had two quick questions as well. The first one is about percussion because you talked a lot about uh, your melodic uh, instruments and voices, but what about percussion? Did you record them as well? Uh, did you record performances or uh, maybe more individual uh, strokes and uh, then put them in a contact instrument? And how, how did you handle the fact that probably some performances weren't really like uh, very, very regular in terms of, uh, of tempo? Percussion? Yeah. For percussion? Uh, well, two ways, I guess. Uh, when Percival was recorded, they, they were recorded in cues, uh, you know, one, like songs, so uh, mm -hmm. there was already like a, a natural accompaniment from, from some, sort of, some sort of a drum to the song, so both files would naturally go well together. However, the majority, however, the majority of sounds would come from samples, I'm afraid. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah for that amount of music, you, you mm. want to you want to have flexibility, which which you, which we didn't get from those recordings, I guess, in terms True. of percussion instruments. Yep. Yeah, yeah. that's why I didn't brag about them, by the way. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so that that leads to my second question: is that how uh, did you manage to handle well uh, the mixing between uh, all these recordings, uh, which have uh, lots of uh, imperfections, I would say, and that what makes them so so great with more. Uh, Super produced uh, elements that we usually use in our DAOs uh, with virtual instruments. And so, how do you, did you manage to really well, mix uh, that and, and, and come out with a successful uh, music? Um, I think that uh, begins with uh, the very first stage. So, uh, setting up the right microphones and picking up the right recording studio. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fortunate enough to, to, to have brilliant uh, recording engineer as my friend. So. The moment I knew I'm going to, to have, you know, several days recording session, uh, I just phoned him, asked if, he, asked if he's available. Fortunately, he was. And I need to admit that he basically did most of the hard work. So proper microphone setup uh, was the very important process because uh, I didn't even know their instruments could sound in their raw, unedited form uh, that good. So later on, when we took those recordings, we had a very good source material we could work on. So that was obviously much, much easier for us to you know, apply all those effects, compressors, and other stuff we, we are using uh, during the process of mixing and producing music. Okay. The, uh, the stuff was also mastered in Los Angeles, which okay. helped. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I really quickly, uh, I remember you guys mentioned that the, uh, the initial onset of your success in this was allowing the musicians to kind of have a jam session instead of going strictly off of what you, what you wrote. Uh, I, I imagine that might create some mess with intellectual property. Is that something you guys had to deal with, or how did you deal with it? Oh, they sold it all to CD Projekt. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, right, well, cool. That's okay, it. I guess that's Thank it. Thank you very much for Thank listening. Thank you very much. Thank you.